Welcome, everybody, to uh, this general meeting of the Emeritus College. I'm Joost Blom, this year's principal of the college, and we start, as we usually do, with a bit of business, uh, and then I'll ask uh, Graham Wynn to introduce today's speaker. Um, just a, a couple of administrative uh, matters to, uh, to draw to your attention. Um, the first is that, and I hope you've been noticing uh, the advertisements for these uh, elsewhere, uh, we, the Emeritus College uh, does administer two awards, um, and the deadline for nominating people for those awards is next week, uh, the 15th. Uh, the first award, uh, just to remind you, is the uh, President's Award for Distinguished Service, uh, awarded to UBC Emeriti, who since attaining a UBC Emeritus status, displayed exceptional leadership in volunteer community services. And then the other award, uh, which uh, was new last year, I think, um, is the uh, Emeritus College Award for Excellence in Innovative and Creative Endeavors. Uh, and then the criteria there are that th this is for emeriti who have demonstrated excellence in their engagement in innovative research, artistic creation, or new applications of previous research since attaining emeritus status. And both of these, uh, you can find uh, more information on the Emeritus College website, but I encourage you that if you uh, have been holding off nominating somebody or have only just this moment thought of somebody you might want nominate, please consider nominating candidates either for the Award for Distinguished Service or for the Award for Excellence in Innovative and Creative Endeavors. Um, and as I say, the 15th of February uh, is the deadline for submitting uh, nominations for that award. And uh, you are, uh, you, you can nominate, you cannot nominate yourself, that is a rule, but you can nominate others uh, in any quantity. So if you have several nominations, all that is fine too. Um, the second item, and there's no particular connection between them, except they're all Emeritus College stuff, um, The uh, is I just want to draw, again, draw to your attention that uh, there will be in, in May this year uh, an event, and I just wanted to sort of have you save the date for it, uh, which is, it's an online event. Now, this is the annual con what originally was supposed to be the annual conference of curac which is the colleges and universities retirees association of canada the associations plural of canada this is uh, the sort of um, a group consisting of or with members uh, of retirees associations from universities and colleges across the country and um, so it is the, the one organization that kind of links us, the Emeritus College, to the other Canadian uh, associations of retirees uh, from the universities and, and from the colleges. Um, and the annual conference, which was originally, uh, <laughs> this is, it was supposed to be two years ago, uh, May 2020, uh, on campus here, that inevitably was cancelled because of the pandemic. Um, then last year, uh, the uh, an online event was held, but it was hosted by McGill because the McGill, uh, the, hosted by the McGill Retirees Association, because uh, it was McGill's 200th anniversary, and that was a big a moment that needed to be uh, marked by this uh, by this event and had had always been planned to be marked for this by this event, um, and so the UBC uh, conference was then to be held this May. Again, we started planning it as an online event, but in the course of last fall, had to uh, sort of concede that really we couldn't, with any confidence, uh, know uh, that it could be held uh, in person. Uh, so we, sorry, planned it in person, and um, 
but uh, we had to switch to an online event, uh, and which we have done. And so this is a one day online event uh, on Thursday, May 19th. It will be from 9.30 a.m. until 1 p.m. And we'll have uh, it, uh, to start with a one hour uh, segment of a keynote address by uh, our colleague, John Helliwell uh, from the School of Economics, uh, who is going to speak on happiness at higher ages. Um, there will then be a short video showing the recipients of the CURAC awards, uh, the people who have done outstanding things within their retiree associations. And then after a break, we'll have an hour and a half session um, uh, call, uh, on, on the theme of aging well, um, and uh, which will in, in, uh, feature uh, three uh, speakers. Um, uh, Angela Brooks Wilson uh, from Simon, Simon Fraser University, Gloria Gutman also from Simon Fraser, um, and Anne Martin Matthews from our own uh, UBC, uh, our Associate VP Health. And um, the three of them will be speaking on, uh, as I say, on various aspects of aging well. And so I invite you to join that um, this event. Uh, there will be registration. Watch the Emeritus College website. You'll be given notice of it in newsletters and in the uh, alerts that come from our office. But um, that will be happening in on May the 19th. Um, the the uh, third item um, is just again to draw your attention to something which is not an Emeritus College uh, initiative, but, uh, but it may be of interest to you as, uh, as Emeriti and, and as people interested in um, the, the sort of the, the uh, the relationship of Emeriti to the university. Um, and this is the uh, planning uh, proce process that has been started uh, under the label sort of Campus Vision 2050. Uh, and the administration has sort of started working on uh, a long range plan for how the campus should evolve um, for the next uh, 38, 30 years or so, um, and, and, you know, uses for the campus lands and uh, things that could be done uh, with respect to life on the campus and so forth. And um, there are a series of events that they are uh, holding to uh, get input on these matters. And as I say, they, these are matters that may well interest uh, Emeriti who uh, are, live somewhere on the campus or who are interested is still in the campus. Um, and there are open, uh, an, there is a public open house, a virtual public open house uh, on this, uh, in, it's tomorrow in fact, um, 5.30 to 6.30. Uh, but uh, it may still be possible to register, but you have to register on the uh, Campus Vision 2050 website. Um, and then in addition to that, on the 15th and 16th of February, there are two workshops uh, for closer discussion of a lot of the issues, which are in person. And again, one can register for those and must register for those. So just if you're interested in uh, the future of the campus and uh, the relationship of people who live here and sort of come here and work here uh, to the campus, I encourage you to, uh, to if you wish, to take part in some of the um, consultations that, the, uh, that are being held on Campus Vision 2050. The next item, I'm almost through, um, but just again to those of you who are uh, emeriti from UBC Okanagan um, may be aware that uh, the last May, the uh, Okanagan Senate uh, passed a resolution uh, supporting and recognizing the establishment of an Okanagan chapter of the Emeritus College. Now, this is not a chapter with separate membership from the main college, all college members are, are members of the same uh, 
in the entity, but uh, there, it was thought it would be useful to have an Okanagan chapter because there, there are, when there are in-person events again, we keep hoping, um, the, the events that are held on the Vancouver, in or around the Vancouver campus are obviously, uh, for most UBC people, if, uh, mostly Maritai from the Okanagan, who still live in the Okanagan, uh, are not going to be uh, easily uh, accessible to them. And so the Okanagan chapter is, um, uh, is there and, and is, uh, we hope, will become the the focus for a good deal of activity for uh, UBC Emeriti who are in the Okanagan, not just UBC O Emeriti, but most of the people living in the Okanagan who are Emeriti probably will be UBCO. Um, and so I went to the membership list and there are about a hundred uh, UBCO Emeriti. Uh, so I hope that uh, the Okanagan chapter will become a very active and, and uh, and, and, and complementary to the uh, activities that are that go on in uh, in Vancouver, and we welcome, uh, and that was really the main point of my raising this. Welcome suggestions from those of you interested in the Okanagan chapter um, as to ways in which the Emeritus College could um, uh, make this chapter a. a sort of an active and successful part of the college. Um, lastly, uh, I just, again, uh, this is a bit of a help wanted notice, um, but I do uh, want to advise you that uh, we are looking for um, a new editor for our newsletter. The uh, wonderful editor that we have, Marjorie Fee, uh, reaches the uh, end of her uh, originally agreed term uh, in June, uh, at the end of June, and uh, she is uh, would prefer not to continue. Uh, she so uh, we will be uh, looking for a volunteer to take over from Marjorie as editor of the newsletter, and anyone who uh, has an interest in, uh, in in taking on that kind of um, role uh, is again encouraged to get in touch with me or get in touch with the uh, Emeritus College office um, and there will be uh, again notices in the newsletter itself and probably via an alert from the office uh, again reminding you of this uh, of this possibility and we there is also an editorial board for whom we hope to uh, for which we hope to attract members as well, but getting an editor is sort of step step one, and a, a, a successor to Marjorie Fee. That's all the administrative matters that I have. Uh, thank you for your attention to these. And I will now uh, turn the uh, proceedings over to Graeme Wynn, our past principal, uh, who uh, will introduce today's speaker. Graeme. Thank you very much, Joost, and thank you everyone for coming to this afternoon's talk. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Daniel Heath Justice. And I have to say, though, that it provides me with uh, the horns of a dilemma. Uh, I've been thinking for a long time about how I might do this. And obviously, one way of approaching an introduction is the familiar one which is to run through the CV essentially of the speaker and to tell everyone what a great and distinguished academic we're just about to hear from. And of course, I could do that full well with Daniel because uh, Daniel is someone who does have a very distinguished CV. It is a remarkable uh, listing of accomplishments in many ways because uh, Daniel is a scholar of many parts. Uh, he has written across and in several genres, uh, literary history. Uh, he has uh, written imaginative science fiction from an indigenous perspective. Uh, 
He has co-edited volumes and encyclopedias. And so we have among us a scholar uh, of considerable uh, versatility and great accomplishment. And that accomplishment is, I think, nowhere better uh, summarized than in the fact that a very short time ago, Daniel, at uh, his uh, very young age, from the perspective of people in the Emeritus College, was elected in the same year, both to a fellowship in the Royal Society and as a member of the Order of Canada. So congratulations, Daniel, on these recognitions, uh, richly deserved. Uh, and uh, I haven't done justice to the full variety and impact of your academic writings, but that's because faced with this dilemma, I wanted to take a somewhat different tack, which is to say, that to unpack Daniel's CV uh, would take more time than I really have. And I know uh, that Daniel is someone who is well worth listening to. So better to move on and have you listen to Daniel than to me uh, reciting his achievements. But before we do that, I do want to say that Daniel came to UBC a decade ago. So he is a relative newcomer among most of us long time servers in the Emeritus College, but he has made a considerable impact in his 10 years here. He is a member of the Department of English and of Crit Critical Indigenous Studies. And uh, I know Daniel in a number of sort of more personal uh, ways. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be tipped off to his arrival when I was chair of the UBC Press uh, Advisory Board, the Publications Board, and I met with Daniel and was delighted when he agreed to join the Publications Board of the Press. For the rest of my time as chair of the board, uh, I came to know Daniel as an astute critic, uh, a wonderful interlocutor in discussions and someone whose opinions and views were always worth taking seriously and listening to uh, with full attention. But I also came to recognize Daniel as someone who, beyond all of this uh, impressive scholarly achievement, is an individual with a quick sense of humor, a lively, uh, pattern of enjoying the moment. And let me just recommend to you uh, for after this talk is over, if you want further evidence of this, uh, an interview that Sheila Rogers did with <laughs> Daniel on CBC, and I'm sure you can capture this from their, their uh, online archive. But Daniel was talking about his uh, book, one of two books focusing on uh, little animals. Uh, he's done one on the badger and one on the raccoon. And Sheila Rogers and Daniel were talking about the raccoon book. And this always informative, uh, always attractive program about literature and writers uh, turned, thanks to Daniel's uh, ready wit and good humor, into something of a memorable laugh fest. Uh, so if you want to capture that side of Daniel, uh, please do go to the Sheila Rogers interview. Uh, the topic today is, if I may prejudge it, uh, somewhat more uh, serious than the, uh, the raccoon, although I do not wish to denigrate the, uh, the importance of our furry animal friend, uh, frequently seen in our backyards. But Daniel today uh, is going to talk to a topic of utmost importance to all of us in contemporary Canada and indeed North America. The title of his talk is Land Back and the Legacies of Allotment, Settler Privatization Schemes and the Restoration of Indigenous Land Relations. Daniel, I'm all ears and thank you for being with us. I know that you are extremely busy. Uh, it's good to see you again, and uh, I will see you at the end of your talk, and I hope have a battery of questions uh, with which you can engage in your usual uh, intriguing way. Thank you. Over Thank to you. you.
that, that was a that was a lovely introduction. Thank you so much, Graham. I, <clears throat> I really appreciate it. I didn't expect the that interview. I actually didn't expect that interview to quite go the way it did. So uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you for citing that. Um, I'm just going to share screen really quickly, and then get this going. Uh, before I get started, you know, it's always good to get started. Um, with gratitude um, and acknowledgement. So I want to thank, first of all, my Seashelf hosts. I am I live in Hulhuai, uh, Half Moon Bay, uh, just here on the Sunshine Coast within the traditional territories of the Seashelf Nation. Um, and I've been very grateful for this opportunity to live and learn in these territories. Um, I want to thank um, our Musqueam and Okanagan hosts. Um, for all of us uh, affiliated with UBC, um, whose languages have been spoken in these lands uh, since time immemorial, and whose deep commitments to the land and to education continue. And I think that's a really important thing when we're doing territorial acknowledgements. We're also talking about acknowledging histories of education, because of course these places have always been lands where learning has been important. I want to thank um, the Emeritus College for this invitation. Thank you so much. And I want to thank all of you for being here. And I particularly want to, um, there are so many people here that I want to acknowledge, but um, I noticed that uh, Joanne Archibald, Richard Vidan, Marjorie Fee, and Patricia Shaw are here uh, in the audience. And I want to just uh, raise my hands up to all of these fine scholars um, with the acknowledgement that they and others have made it possible for us to have a robust indigenous community at UBC as part of the intellectual life and the scholarly life uh, at UBC. And these four colleagues I've worked with in various capacities, but um, they've done a huge amount, as have other people um, in the audience, have done a huge amount to not only make space, but to keep space for uh, for Indigenous studies and Indigenous scholars. So, Wado uh, Ganali, I'm very grateful to all of you, and thank you for being here. So, just really briefly, so I'm I'm just going to kind of mosey along through the through the presentation because I do hope that we have some good time uh, to have a conversation at the end. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what I about land back and the legacies of allotment, and I'll explain all of these things. Uh, talk very briefly about a. a an important Supreme Court decision um, in, from 2020 that is relevant to this. And then a project that um, is just about to drop, um, a book project that I've been part of. And then we'll just open it up to a conversation. And I'm going to pre-apologize. I've got three bulldogs in my office right now. Um, right now they're asleep, but there are times when they're not. So if you ever hear weird noises from elsewhere, they've probably decided to start playing. So I will try to keep that uh, the noise disruption to a minimum. But with bulldogs, you can never quite tell. So I want to start with this phrase from Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang from their very well cited essay, Decolonization is not a metaphor. Um, and for those, uh, I will read some of these things out just to help those um, who may have visual impairment. Decolonization brings about the repatriation of indigenous land and life. It is not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our societies and schools. And I just want us to hold on to that phrase and think about when we hear decolonization, what does that mean? Um, very often it has become watered down to the point of really not meaning much, but what do we mean when we talk decolonization? Well, one answer to that is land back. And some of you may have heard land back and some of you may have not, may not have, but certainly um, the conversations around uh, protest, like the Wet'suwet'en uh, uh, protest and action uh, here in BC, the con um, conversations around um, Six Nations lands uh, in Southern Ontario, many of these conversations are actually being framed around the idea of land back, um, which is diverse, it's global, um, and it's Indigenous led, and it's really pushing back on the ideas of um, that we can have 
a just relationship without thinking very seriously seriously about what what land means and who what the legacy of land dispossession has meant for indigenous peoples and it's not enough to talk about settlement it's also important you know the financial settlement for lands taken but also about restoring lands and land relations. Um, and this is, I think, particularly important in a time of reconciliation, which becomes increasingly fraught um, when it is disconnected from actually restoring people's relationships to, um, to community, to language, um, and to land and territory. Um, it's very much about the restoration of authority and access to territory. It's, it can't be seen as disconnected from land. And when we're talking about this, I think it's really important. We're not necessarily talking about throwing everybody else off the land. What we're talking about is making sure that indigenous people have access to their territories and that the relationships to those territories are restored and strengthened. Um, I've very, very rarely heard any arguments about um, removing others because we know what that's like. Uh, but it is about how do we restore our authority and our legal traditions and our um, cultural practices in those territories and have those protected. Um, land back directly addresses land loss. It directly addresses dispossession. And it directly addresses not only the historical impacts, but the continuing effects. And it attends to the history of extraction, um, extractive industries of all kinds, um, and the ongoing attempts to coerce indigenous peoples into land surrender. These are not 19th century phenomena. They're not early 20th century phenomena. They are current and they're gaining steam yet again. So this is a, a quotation that rarely gets quoted, um, but I think needs to be more, from Thomas King's um, oft-cited and well-regarded uh, Inconvenient Indian. And I'm going to go ahead and read this out um, in full. And the question he's responding to is, you know, he often in conversations, people ask him, well, what do, what do Native people want? And so he's starting, he actually starts off saying, well, that's the wrong question. The question is, what do whites want? What do white people want? What um, and then this is where he goes, what do whites want? No, it's not a trick question, and I'm not being sarcastic. Native history in North America has never been about Native people. It's been about whites and their needs and desires. What Native people wanted has never been a vital concern, has never been a political or social priority. The issue that came ashore with the French and the English and the Spanish, the issue that has made its way from coast to coast to coast and is with us today, the issue that has never changed, never varied, never faltered in its resolve is the issue of land. The issue has always been land. It will always be land until there isn't a square foot of land left in North America that is controlled by native people. Now this can read as a very cynical and maybe uh, despairing note, um, but I think in the context of the book, it's actually, I do think it's actually a hopeful book, um, but this is a, it's a really, it's a really powerful indictment of that relationship. And this is 2013. We're now, you know, almost 10 years past that. Um, it's still, it's still an acute question. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we've gotten to this point where we're calling for land back because of this history of, of dispossession. This is not an all-inclusive list, but I think these are some of the major ways that indigenous peoples have been dispossessed of our territories. And some of the, the main issues that we're trying to address in terms of the restoration of those relations and ties. Obviously the big one is genocide um, and and the really active violence of warfare which includes starvation which includes um, uh, being uh, had not having access to traditional uh, medicine so you have all the uh, compounding health impacts um, and then just the physical violence that goes with that this also includes things like kidnapping um, it includes uh, slavery of various kinds, but all of these associated ways of subjugating a community. Um, ethnic cleansing and removal. I mean, my nation, Cherokee Nation, is most famous in the US because of the Trail of Tears. 
um, you know, the removal of of Cherokee people from the southeast, what is now the southeastern U.S. journey on which about a, th a fourth of our population died. Um, but we are not the only people who were removed. And this was under the auspices of the Indian Removal Act of, eight, of 1830. Uh, we were one of many nations who had that impact. And many nations actually suffered much worse uh, population loss as a result. Um, then there's assimilation. Um, and assimilation comes in many forms. It, it can be very forced. It can be coerced, which isn't too far from forced. And it can also be encouraged and st strongly encouraged, uh, but without necessarily the same level of um, implied or explicit violence. But assimilation is also a way to remove people from territory. And then you know, what's particularly important for me in this presentation is the privatization of land. Um, and specifically privatization to facilitate transferability. Privatization doesn't f really help with some of these other things to dis dispossess indigenous peoples if you can't actually move the property from indigenous ownership to non-indigenous ownership. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, that privatization on its own was always a means to an end. Um, and so Friends of the Indian, uh, is, is a category of, of social reformers in the U.S. in particular um, in the late 19th century uh, for whom who saw themselves as great advocates for indigenous people at a time when indigenous people were under horrendous assault of uh, physical, ideological, linguistic, um, and otherwise. But as is often the case, um, it was an advocacy that came with a lot of cultural uh, presumptions. Um, and it was not about stopping the violence against indigenous peoples. It was about directing the violence to transform indigenous peoples. Um, and so looking at the state of communities in the late 19th century and you know, after, after centuries of uh, brutalized impact, and seeing that state not as the consequence of really horrendous uh, colonial policies, but as a kind of inevitable state of nature. Um, and so their idea was to transform native people into a servile class in the state and then kind of avoid the any accountability for the violence that put indigenous peoples into such a precarious position, uh, but then also to take credit for that transformation. And these are the, the three main uh, modes I'm looking at here are Christianization, assimilative education, and the privatization of collective land holdings. I do want to say one thing about Christianization. When I'm talking about its impacts on communities, I'm not dismissing the fact that a lot of indigenous people today are are devout Christians. Most Cherokees are Southern Baptist. Um, and my aunt was a very devout Baptist. Um, I am not a Christian, but many of my, um, of my friends and family are. And so I think we have to, we can talk about the impacts of Christianization on our communities without dismissing um, the ways in which a lot of communities have taken these things and put them to use for our own purposes. Um, and it's also, I think, important in Cherokee Nation and in Oklahoma uh, context, a lot of our languages were actually preserved in the church. And we can talk about that in question period if, if folks would like. Whereas in a lot of other places, churches were active um, weapons against uh, language, language health. But I think all, these three things together are important to think of not in isolation, but as working very much in tandem to change the way we we related to the land um, because as we relate to the land we also relate to one another and to our communities and to uh, you know to the cosmoverse to to all of it so um it's they replace spiritual and kinship relations to the land to with heteronormative and patriarchal structures. I mean, that's just a kind of fundamental thing. Um, it looks at the land not as a network of relations, but as 
a thing and a thing that can be objectified and a thing that can be transferred to other people. Um, it shifts accountability from community to arbitrary authorities. And it really, not all communities were non-hierarchical, we know that, um, but in many cases it, it looks to a, a very arbitrary hierarchy for authority rather than community consent. Um, and then it also locates knowledge as being something that is imported into the community rather than something that is part of the community and expands outward. So this is the um, the poison pill of civilization, if you will. Um, and again, privatization presumes land as a thing. It thingifies um, those relationships. Um, and it when we start looking at the rationales for privatization, it has to be separated from um, thinking of land as having any sort of sacred relationship. It has to be disconnected from land as something that you have obligations to um, and that you have accountability toward. Um, and so when we look at some of the um, action uh, by indigenous peoples in Canada in particular over the last uh, decade and a half, a lot of the work of land back has been about restoring the health of ecosystems. So uh, water defenders, uh, land defenders, you know, making sure that um, uh, certain animals populations are protected and not destroyed. Um, but always these kind of get repurposed around uh, by the settler state as extractive resources. So if we're protecting them, we're protecting them as resources, not as relations. Um, and again, privatization requires desacralization, disconnection, and alienation. And again, a key feature is transferability and disposability. You can dispose of your land and give it to somebody else. And that radically alters um, cosmology it radically alters uh, relationships. Um, and again, that disconnection, I mean, that's partly what residential schools were about. It was about removing indigenous children from communities and from their lands where those, those uh, kinship relations were deeply, deeply rooted, where you had entire story cycles that were attached to the lands that people lived on to move them not just kind of into a school, but a school very often, not exclusively, but many times, a school that was very far from home. Um, and then into a space where all meaning was supposed to be kind of contained within the authority of the church and its cultural productions. And that's just one example of the many ways that these ideas of land um, and family were very much interwoven and the various levels of attack that they received from a lot of different directions. And I've already kind of gone over this, what, um, how they inform and support one another. Education, religion, privatization, disconnection. Um, this is a pretty quick and dirty history, but I just wanted to give a little bit of this because I think it helps to inform where we're going from here. And again, with any of this, I'm happy to, to talk um, at length in the, in the discussion. So I'm taking us to the States, um, partly because that's where my nation is um, and where I was raised, but also because the allotment policies of the US, um, allotment didn't begin in the US, but it took on a particular kind of mode that was then exported across the world and has certainly influenced and um, impacted ways that privatization of indigenous lands has been seen um, across across the world, but particularly in the Anglosphere. Uh, so 1887, it was named for Senator Henry Dawes. And so it's generally called the Dawes Act, um, although it was the General Allot Allotment uh, Severalty Act um, as, as well. That was a, a, the primary way it was understood. Um, authorized division of collective indigenous land holdings into individually owned parcels of land. So you take something that the entire community has responsibility for and cut that down. Um, mostly it was around 160 acres. That varied by community. It also varied according to whether you were um, the primary 
um, authority in the household, you know, often men, but you know, oftentimes women as well. Um, and there, so there was some variation depending on the nation, but typically it was around 160 acres. Um, and the Friends of the Indian and Senator Dawes, they were very explicit. Um, this was to facilitate assimilation. There was no beating around the bush. Um, today's privatization advocates are much less honest uh, about that. But these folks, like they were, they had a religious duty. Um, and they were very, very clear. And they were also clear about the consequences. And they understood that this was going to hurt. Um, but, you know, it wasn't hurting them. So, uh, so this was initially applied to other nations. But uh, with the Curtis Act in 1898, this was extended over um, the, the five, what were at the time called the five civilized tribes. Um, but now we generally just call the five tribes. And uh, I'm just going to close my camera for a second so you can see. Um, this is the territory that we're talking about with the Curtis Act. So it's um, the eastern part of what is now Oklahoma. Um, and it was implemented piecemeal uh, over uh, just over 40 years, um, over 118 reservations, and resulted in the loss to indigenous peoples of over 100 million acres, which was about two thirds of land still in indigenous possession at the end of the 19th century. Um, so it was a profoundly impactful uh, piece of legislation and, and other pieces of legislation attached to it. Um, and uh, it still has a really significant effect on a lot of communities today. Um, actually, I, don't, I can't think of a single community that was subjugated to allotment legislation that isn't now dealing with some pretty profound challenges as a result of it. Um, President Theodore Roosevelt was a big booster of allotment um, and of the Allotment Act. And I think this is, um, oh, sorry. This is uh, a helpful quotation, uh, a pretty chilling one. In my judgment, the time has arrived and we should definitely make up our minds to recognize the Indian as an individual and not as a member of a tribe. The General Allotment Act is a mighty pulverizing engine to break up the tribal mass. It acts directly upon the family as well as the individual. Uh, the Indian should be treated as an individual like the white man. During the change of treatment, inevitable hardship will occur. Every effort should be made to minimize these hardships, but we should not, because of them, hesitate to make the change. So again, I mean, there was no doubt that they knew that this was going to be catastrophic. Um, and the language, a mighty pulverizing engine to break up the tribal mass. I mean, that's, it's so evocative and so horrifying. Um, but it was, it was understood to be destructive. Um, but again, it wasn't, it wasn't their families being subjected to the pulverizing engine. Uh, Senator Dawes, when he visited my nation, um, as part of his argument, he actually talked about how successful we were at being civilized. Um, and our success was an example of our failure. So he said, uh, there was not a pauper in the nation, and the nation does not owe a dollar. It, is, it built its own capital and built its schools and hospitals. Yet the defect of the system was apparent. They have got as far as they can go because they hold their land in common. There is no selfishness, which is at the bottom of civilization. So it didn't matter that we didn't have an impoverished class. It did not matter that um, our people had homes and had food enough. Um, it did not matter that we actually had a robust school system, the best school system uh, west of the Mississippi, actually, far superior to anything uh, that was led by the Americans. Um, we had our land in common and that, and we had a common, we had a common wheel. We had a common uh, sense of obligation to one another. And that was the problem. Um, so again, they were, they were quite specific. There was no, there was no mystery about what this, what was going on here. Uh, another quotation, I won't read the whole thing, but I think the, the key point being, they will feel more readily inclined to part 
with a, such of their lands as they cannot themselves cultivate. Uh, and Carl Schurz was another uh, really uh, influential member of the Friends of the Indian. It was very clearly about ensuring that the lands of indigenous people be transferred to non-indigenous people. And there was, there was no question. There was, there, they weren't trying to um, avoid the implications. They understood what the implications were. Um, and then, again, just to point out, this is not limited to the 1880s or the 1890s or the early 1900s. Um, this is still an ongoing conversation, and it's actually picking up steam yet again. So this is from Thomas Flanagan and Christopher. Now, I can't actually see all of my screen because I've got part of the image on the side. Um, but just to remind us um, about the, the narrative here, it seems evident that developing workable systems of private property rights to facilitate market transactions will be a necessary, if not sufficient, precondition to attaining widespread prosperity on Indian reserves. But the conclusion reached by economics and political science and the evidence of history indicates that in the long run, collective property is the path of poverty and private property is the path of prosperity. I think we, I think the jury is still very much out on the, um, the conclusions reached, uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit about a book that's coming out that uh, talks about that. Um, but it, it remain it. A lot of the uh, rationale for privatization of indigenous lands that was at the heart of the Allotment Act and its devastations are being recycled today. But again, not quite as honestly. The um, the century plus of catastrophe that accompanied allotment um, is almost entirely evaded in those conversations. Um, and one of the reasons that it's important for me to, to talk about these, about allotment in our current age is to bring some of that history um, and the evidence of history that they quote, because it's not, um, it's not, I don't think the evidence of history actually supports their claims that um, collective property is the path of poverty. Um, in fact, Communities that were self-sufficient, that had very high rates of uh, of well-being, that had very strong uh, social networks, that had strong families, that had good education, um, that had clean waters and good health, um, saw those devastated by the allotment policy. Um, and then some of the policies that followed on afterwards. Um, so that's not to say that there aren't other ways that communities have attended to uh, property and that there aren't very diverse ways of understanding property. Uh, but it is to say that um, private property as imposed by the Allotment Act and other privatization schemes has not been for the benefit of indigenous peoples. It has decidedly been for the benefit of non-indigenous people. Um, this is just a, an image that I think is uh, kind of fascinating. Indian land for sale. And, you know, this is just after allotment um, and looking at ways in which, you know, that transferability was very, very explicit. And this was about expanding homesteading and expanding uh, the U.S. government's authority over lands as well. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a sense of how that was um, advertised. And these flyers were, were distributed widely um, in the East. So um, Indian territory, just to give you a little bit of a context here, uh, before allotment, over 20 million acres were held by the five tribes, uh, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Muscogee Creek, and Seminole nations. Um, by 1928, that had been reduced to not even 2 million acres, so a tenfold um, uh, loss in, in, in I mean, we're just looking at land itself, right? And this was through, um, not just through the allotments, but even after allotment, a lot of people lost their lands through willing or coerced sale, uh, fraudulent trusteeship, which was a really horrifying um, history, through graft, through theft. Um, the trusteeship, uh, very soon Martin Scorsese will have a film coming out called Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, which uh, stars um, Leonardo DiCaprio, and it deals with um, 
the the legacy of of allotment on the Osage reservation um, and some of the land uh, and resource losses, but the ways in which a lot of white people would have themselves named as trustees for orphans. Um, and then the orphans would disappear and the trustee would get their oil rights. Um, so it's a really grim, uh, a grim history that uh, in that region, and it's not just in that region, it happened all over the place. Um, but just to give you a little bit of a sense there of uh, what happened. And again, this is a clearer map. So in the upper right hand corner is the Cherokee Nation. Um, and then the Creek Nation is right beside us. And you can see also there are quite a few others. So these are it, Indian territory. This is, you know, over 40 different tribal nations um, who call Oklahoma home. Um, but when I'm talking about Indian territory in particular at the allotment period, it's really the, the eastern side of the state um, because Oklahoma territory was carved out on the, on the western half uh, before Oklahoma statehood. And so this is Indian territory as of uh, 1891. Statehood, Oklahoma statehood was precipitated by allotment. Um, and the five tribes tried very hard to create an Indian majority state. They proposed a constitutional convention for a state called Sequoia. And Sequoia was a Cherokee uh, philosopher who created our uh, written language, our syllabary. Um, but that uh, the five tribes leaned Democrat and Theodore Roosevelt was a Republican and didn't want a uh, Democratic uh, majority state. And so he put the, put the skids on uh, a two state solution. Um, and so there was just uh, Oklahoma, the state of Oklahoma, but the state of Oklahoma emerged out of the allotment process. And just to give you a little bit of a sense, so, you know, we're talking about individual collective lands made into individual land holdings. So on the left, we have um, a map of the Chickasaw Nation in 1900, um, and on the right, four years later. And so you can see the pace of individual allotment. And as you look at that, every one of these orange dots is an individual allotment. And you can also see all, all kinds of open space in between that. Um, so families were often very close together, but you you had a very difficult time. It, many families had a hard time making a living on their singular allotment. Um, and as they start to um, have more difficulty, there are all kinds of folks around them who are like, sell me your allotment. We'll give you a little bit of, of money. Um, we'll look after you. And so you start to see it checkerboarded and you start to see more and more of the land being lost. And so people who are able to hold on to them, they stop, they start losing their families. So if they had their allotments together, families start to disappear and disperse. Um, and of course, you know, a little bit of cash doesn't last for very long. Um, my great granddad um, had uh, 160 acres split up over two allotments and he had 17 kids. Um, you cannot raise a family on that size of an acreage in that part of Oklahoma with that, with that many. And so he um, ultimately moved to Eastern Colorado and then moved to uh, California where he died. This just gives you a little bit of a sense of how that looked um, in just a very short period of time. And then if you would look at the same map 20 years later, almost all of those orange uh, boxes would be gone because they, they would have passed into hands of non-Indigenous people. And so this is the Cherokee Nation. Um, and our family allotments are on the right-hand side, uh, just north of, of Tulsa, which isn't on the map. And I can't actually, oh, yeah, actually, I can do it. Sorry, an annotation here. Except my mouse isn't quite working. Uh, there we go. Oh, I can't. I can't see it anyway. Um, sorry, I'll just go back one here. Oh. Uh, so anyway, the, our family allotments are on the right-hand side. So most of the Cherokee Nation now is held um, in 
non-Cherokee hands. This is my great granddad, Amos Spears, and my grandmother, Pearl Spears, um, early 1940s. Uh, my dad was uh, significantly older than my mom, so um, he, we have a, quite a generational gap there, but uh, they are in eastern Colorado um, in this photo. But Amos was an, an original Alati of the Cherokee Nation. Just to put some faces on some of these histories. Um, and here you can see, so on the right-hand side, if you look where it says Vera there, that's a, a, no longer a, a town in Oklahoma, um, but that was the nearest um, community to where my uh, great-granddad had his allotment. If you go over to number 27, just to the left there, you'll see a box and a 27, and just at the bottom of the two, you'll see Amos Spears, and that's my great-granddad. That's one of his... Um, one of his allotments. Um, his brother and his oldest son, their allotments are connected to the north. And then we've got some, um, oh, actually his brother has is off to the left there. Uh, one of his sons is um, just above him. We've got some Riley family members around there. So you can see uh, that families often had their allotments close to one another. But again, you can see it didn't take very much time for the allotments to start to get filled in. And if you look at the map on the right, we have um, a, over 30, 40 of these maps, and it's just all of these names, um, which is a pretty remarkable snapshot of kinship relations in the nation at the time. And so a process that was intended really to break up our community relationships, actually these documents now are used by a lot of people to kind of restore uh, an understanding of those family ties. There's a mythology that has arisen in the, the later 20th century that the Dawes Act um, kind of imposed um, a, a kind of genealogy on, on tribes and that it, it compiled the records. All of the records of the Dawes um, of the Dawes uh, Commission themselves were taken from tribally developed roles. Our communities actually had a huge say in who was and was not on the roles. Um, and so you can also see here, there's also a, a story that uh, that people were separated, that the Dawes um, agents just kind of wrote down people's names very randomly. That didn't tend to be the case. Uh, most of the time, people were able to uh, petition for specific plots of land and typically did so near one another. So it's a it's a really complicated history uh, and it's one that needs a lot more research, but you can get a good sense of how how families did try to stay together. But again, as you start to lose these allotments, families start to um, separate and people start to to move. And so you can see the unraveling of community relationships um, as time goes on, as the land is um, disconnected from people and their families. So on the these are impacts on the Cherokee Nation in particular, but it would certainly have been shared with other nations. Uh, but for us, we lost um, almost all of our land holdings. So we had 4.4 million acres as allotment closed down. And now, well, as of 2009, we had 100,000. I think we have less than that now. Um, so that's that's pretty dramatic. Um, with allotment, our government was dissolved by legislative fiat of the US government. Um, our courts were um, canceled. Um, any, any authority we had over our own lives and justice systems and education was completely taken away from us. So we went from being a very um, self-sustaining sovereign people to one that was very firmly under uh, under the thumb of the Oklahoma establishment. And again, it's a disruption of family and kinship. And we see that today. We have 400,000 citizens in the Cherokee Nation. Um, obviously, 400,000 of us would not be strong in strong kinship ties. I mean, that's we are dispersed all over the world. And so for us, we don't there is increasingly a way of, of 
moving away from kind of individual kinship um, accountability to lineal descent. So to be a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, you have to prove descent from the original allotment role um, in 1906. Um, it doesn't mean that you're in good kin relations. It doesn't mean that you have any cultural knowledge. You just have to prove descent. And that starts to change people's relationship to what it is to be Cherokee. Um, and so you start to identify ethnically rather than as a people. And you start to identify more as a as a kind of patriotism rather than an obligation to a family. Um, it has absolutely impacted cultural continuity and language use. So again, we have 400,000 citizens. We only have 2,000 fluent speakers of the Cherokee language. That's more than a lot of communities have, but in terms of the total population, it's a pretty um, dismal number. Um, and we have very strong language revitalization work and do, the folks are doing great stuff but there's a lot of concern. There's a lot of fear um, as a result. Excuse me just a second. Um, and then uh, an increasing identification with whiteness. And I think that's one thing that uh, Cherokees have to reckon with. Um, associated with that identification with whiteness is a, an adoption of a lot of anti-blackness. Um, we have a long history of chattel slavery as well. Um, so there are, there are consequences, and a lot of these can be tied to the impacts of allotment and the dispersals that happened as a result. Um, it's, it's not as though we have ceased to be a people, but it, there, these legacies still continue, and they do require um, honesty in addressing. Another thing that's kind of, I, I saw this chart and I thought I'd throw this on here. Um, another way that this dispossession works is uh, fractionation. So the example here is you have an allottee. When it, even if the allotment stays in the family and isn't sold, um, as the generations go, so the original allottee has three children, all of whom own equal shares. Then all of their heirs get equal shares. And then all of their heirs get equal shares until the point that you can have over 200 or more. There are some fra um, allotments that ha have a thousand owners. Um, and so it c then there's really almost nothing that you can do with that. You can't, because you have to get everybody's agreement. Um, this has facilitated land, land loss in Oklahoma as well, because Oklahoma has a really empowered squatters' rights legislation. So if you aren't actively looking after your land, then somebody can squat on it and within 10 years own it outright. That's Oklahoma law. Um, and so fractionated allotments are, are really easy to lose because you've dispersed uh, responsibility um, for that. So just a, another kind of harrowing chart that I wanted to share. So this brings me to a project that I've been working on with my colleague, Gene O'Brien, who's a white earth Ojibwe historian at the University of Minnesota. Um, and it actually has its origins from here at UBC uh, for the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association conference uh, we had here, I believe in 2015. And Jeannie and I were just talking about work that we were doing, and I had just been doing some work on a lot and, and talked about the devastations of allotments, specifically on my family. And she said how interesting that was because in her community, uh, White Earth Ojibwe's, allotment actually brought people back to community. It didn't push them away. And so we started having a conversation about the different ways that our communities dealt with the, the challenges of allotment. And we thought, well, you know, I'm sure there are some other there are other examples. And so we put out a call for papers and we had over 30 uh, contributors reach out with stories from all across the world that were really focused on how do indigenous people grapple with privatization? You know, some communities have taken privatization up as a way of preserving and protecting things. Others have pushed very hard against it. Uh, and we managed to get a, a collection out of it. So it's a multi-genre, multinational, um, diverse uh, volume that looks at the issue of privatization 
and Indigenous people's response to that. So that's coming out next month, and we're very excited. Uh, hopefully, it really prompts some good conversations. But it's uh, it's been a, a labor of love, but also a pretty grim uh, experience as well to see just how common these experiences are, but also really inspiring to see how Indigenous peoples have been very active and creative and pushing back and sometimes using those mechanisms to preserve land and relations and sometimes um, demanding other options. Um, so I'm just wrapping up here uh, just to kind of give a little bit of context for the moment as well. Um, so you saw those maps of Oklahoma, you know, the map behind me uh, of Indian Territory. In 2020, the Supreme Court came down with one of the few wins we've ever had in terms of land rights, um, where they actually said that um, the Muscogee Creek Nation, that their reservation boundaries were still intact, that allotment hadn't destroyed them because there was no congressional legislation that dissolved the reservation itself. Um, and this was in relation to a crime that had been committed um, on the Muscogee Reservation that Oklahoma had claimed authority to prosecute. Um, that, uh, so the Supreme Court actually said, no, our reservation still stood. So this was actually federal and tribal authority. It had nothing to do with the state. Um, and so other uh, courts have found the same for the other, uh, the other tribes in Oklahoma. So um, Oklahoma, not surprisingly, appealed immediately and appealed repeatedly. Um, but thus far, they've been fir pretty firmly rebuffed, including a, a week before last. The Supreme Court pushed back 30 appeals that Oklahoma had put forward um, in the last session. So there's still strong support for the McGirt decision. Um, but there's still very deep investment, because this, this means that Oklahoma does not have ultimate authority over tribes. Um, and there are a lot of folks in Oklahoma who are not happy with that. Uh, tribes are happy, but uh, uh, white officials are not. Um, and one of the sad things for me is that the Oklahoma governor, who is the biggest opponent to tribal sovereignty, is a Cherokee Nation citizen. Um, and we have a lot of opinions about that. Um, but, you know, you, uh, you just have to deal with, with those realities. There's lots of complexities there. Um, but there's also clearly a lot of money coming from um, extractive industry and from some Oklahoma fan families supporting uh, reactionary candidates in tribal elections. And we're dealing with some of that in the Cherokee Nation right now. So uh, yeah, it's, it's still an ongoing issue and it's going to continue. Um, as such. And it's he happening here in Canada as well. The Fraser Institute is uh, taking a much more interest in um, Indigenous lands and resources and putting forward uh, talks and policy papers on privatization as an, an unalloyed good for Indigenous communities. Um, again, without taking up any of the history of, of what this has meant for communities. So, um, we should be very aware that these conversations are taking place right now. Um, and there are a lot of people who are supporting them. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up. I keep seeing chats, questions come into chat, and I'm not sure if it's Graham or not, but I want to make sure we have plenty of room. Um, I bet I can't see where my mouse is on here. So I'm just going to uh, share the Supreme Court decision. I've never cried reading a Supreme Court decision before. And I did when this came down. I did not expect McGirt to go our way at all. And nobody I talked to did. We were shocked. But um, Gorich, uh, you know, and this is a very, um, this is, this is big for us. Uh, Gorich wrote the majority opinion, on the far end of the Trail of Tears was a promise. And it's, beautiful poetry um, in that. Today we are asked whether the land these treaties promised remains an Indian reservation for purposes of federal criminal law. Because Congress has not said otherwise, we hold the government to its word. Um, we'll see where that goes. I mean, what they did say was that if Congress decides to abrogate those treaties, it's within its right to do so, but it has not done so thus far. So there's still a door left open. There will still be struggles and challenges. Um, but I have to say this, every time I read this, I get chills. This is one of the few Supreme Court decisions that has, that saw us. Um, and I am hopeful that it's, it's not an anomaly. And so I'd just like to close by reminding us that like decolonization, land back is not a metaphor for Indigenous people. 
It's not property that we're talking about. It's the restoration of worlds. And I just want to thank you all very much and uh, open that up to questions and discussion. So wado, dodada go honi. Thank you. Wado, Daniel. Thank you very much indeed. That's a fascinating and thought-provoking talk. And uh, our first question in the chat, which is from Nikki Hall, has said as much. <clears throat> I would encourage people to put questions into the chat and I'll try to get through as many as we can muster for Daniel, because I'm sure there's much more to say and deal with here. But let me begin with Nikki Hall's question. Uh, she says that you mentioned someone who created a written language for the Cherokee nation. When was this? And could you say a bit more about that? Yeah, so this is Sequoia, and I would actually encourage you, if you get a chance, um, there is a documentary called Searching for Sequoia on PBS in the States, and you might be able to find it online. Um, uh, Sequoia was a silversmith, um, and he was uh, from a, a prominent uh, community, uh, but he, there's not a lot that we know about him. Um, other than we, we do know that he existed, we know he was a silversmith, um, he was a veteran, uh, but he, in the early uh, 19th century, he developed a, a written syllabary, uh, and the, the number of characters varies. It's 80, I think his original one was 86, I think we have 84 now, um, but it is, uh, it's a syllabary, so it's, it's based on the syllables of the Cherokee language, um, and he is one of the few people who is known to have created a language entirely out of whole cloth like he he developed this over the course of of about uh 15 years and it was it was a game changer for Cherokee so we didn't have to take on um English or French or Spanish we could actually communicate with one another across vast distances in our own language um and it was very readily taken up and fluent Cherokees could become literate in the syllabary in a very short time. And because of our dispersals from the East to the West, and then also down into Texas and Mexico, um, it was a way for Cherokees to communicate with one another across those distances. So um, he is definitely seen as one of our great um, intellectual uh, luminaries. Um, and his, the syllabary is still very much in use today. Uh, and, you know, if you go to uh, Cherokee Nation, if you're in Northeast Oklahoma, you'll see the syllabary in many places. But uh, it's a really remarkable story. There's a lot of mythology attached to that. Um, but he, he, regardless of, of all of those, like, you know, was he a... Was he a full blood Cherokee? Was he mixed blood? And, you know, and those, are, those are terms that are used in the Cherokee Nation very specifically. Um, was he... Uh, was he familiar with with other forms of writing? No, that, so there are a lot of questions, but he he was certainly uh, a very important uh, Cherokee and uh, remains so today. Thank you, Daniel. We have a number of questions here, so I'm going to uh, jump ahead a little bit and mm -hmm. go for one which has a, a quick answer. Uh, it could be yes or no. Uh, Cindy Greenwood asks, were women included in the distribution of land? They were, yeah. So um, head of household was not necessarily gendered. So there were a lot of women who uh, were seen as head of household as well. Um, and then, you know, a lot of children, like the, the distribution in Cherokee Nation and in Indian Territory, it was based on citizenship. It wasn't about whether or not you were, what your gender was. So if you were, so we had three categories, uh, Cherokee by blood, Cherokee by marriage, and Cherokee freedmen, who were the um, enfranchised uh, descendants of, of African American slaves in the nation. Each individual who was a citizen got an allotment. Um, now, heads of households usually got more land than minors or non-heads of household, um, but the distribution did go to all citizens. As long as you were a citizen, you got land. Thank you. I'm going to try and combine a couple of questions here, sure. one from Vijay Verna and one from Sander Kalasol. Uh, Vijay asks, what do you think will be decided in the next 25 or 50 years in terms of allotment? And Sander uh, 
says, uh, asks about the effect of the melting pot concept and uh, notions of, of multinationalism on the outcome of the allotment process. Uh, it, I, I'm always really hesitant to predict the future. Uh, like I said, I didn't think McGirt would go our way. Um, I think regardless of whether it goes, we're still going to be fighting. Um, so I, I think we, we have increased attention and appreciation for a lot of people on these issues, but we're, we're up against some really powerful forces in Oklahoma and in the States. Um, so, you know, we're, and a lot depends on the composition of the Supreme Court and a lot depends on who's in Congress. So um, I think it's going to be a fight no matter what. In terms of the melting pot, um, you know, that's a, that's a complicated one because the melting pot didn't always work. Like it, it was often seen as an immigration model rather than a model kind of like indigenous peoples were, were to assimilate, but were pretty much to become kind of erased. Uh, and of course, you know, African, anybody with African heritage was, was very much kind of outside the white supremacy of the of the melting pot metaphor. Um, and so I think there were ways that it worked that could kind of see indigenous people um, as being part of the great melting pot, but but the melting pot depended on our erasure um, in a lot of ways. And so there was all that was always kind of a rough edge for indigenous peoples um, in that metaphor. Um, and there's still there's still a lot of struggle about, you know, were we Americans or are we sovereign nations? Oklahoma has a hell of a time with us as, as nations, right? That's part of what these lawsuits are about is Oklahoma insists that it has authority over our lands. It insists that it has a uh, criminal jurisdiction over us. Um, and we have consistently said that's not the case. So I think multinationalism, we're certainly down for that. Um, I'm not sure Oklahoma is. Thank you. There's a, a final question from David Edgington, uh, which goes to your new book uh, collection, Allotment Stories. And David asks whether there are any successful cases of putting privatized land back into collective ownership. Actually, there's a really great essay by one of our UBC colleagues, Cheryl Lightfoot, on specifically that issue, because her community asked um, allotment, um, allotment holders to return it to the tribe. And so her, her essay is entirely about that conversation and the difficulty of that conversation, um, you know, because now people, people had a personal investment in those individual holdings. And so her piece is all about the struggle in her family to decide whether or not to sell land back to the tribe or not. And, you know, some of her family did and some of her family didn't. Uh, so it's it's a really beautifully written piece, and it's one thing we didn't want from this collection was just to to have it be kind of a singular story, but to look at all of the complexities in that. And I thought that was a a really interesting story. There's also one here, um, it, not on that topic, but another family story from Jennifer Adese, who's a Métis scholar, who talks about. Um, uh, the process uh, script for the dead. So Métis script was a privatization sort of um, process, but she talks about how it was used by white men for their dead Métis relatives. Um, so another really fascinating story that talks about these complexities in different ways. So, but yes, absolutely. That one story in particular uh, addresses that uh, specifically. Thank you, Daniel. I don't have any more questions in the chat. Uh except uh, a late one from Nikki Hall here. Uh, we hear that indigenous people don't believe in ownership of land. If that's right, is it agreed amongst all the indigenous nations in America that 4.4 million acres is Cherokee nation land? Well, that's, a, that's actually a really interesting question. So the, to the first part of that, different communities had different understandings of of authority over particular land bases, 
So uh, when we talk about ownership of land, it, it's really, really complicated. Um, and I think we, we have to be careful that we don't kind of presume a singular mode. Um, here in the, uh, in the West Coast, communities had really well-defined authority over particular kinds of, of land bases and the resources that were there, and also deep relationships with the other than human peoples and the land. So it was, it was multi-layered and multi-leveled. Um, so, you know, this area in Oklahoma, like we were removed to that territory. Our homeland is in what's now Tennessee and Georgia and North Carolina and, and other areas there. So we were actually forcibly relocated to that 4.4 million acres, um, which was most like Osages claimed that land. So it's very, very complicated. Now the Osage reservation, you know, the Osages recognize us as neighbors. Um, our it's recognized as our reservation land, but the Osages will be very clear that this is also Osage land, right? Um, and so we we have overlapping histories, we have overlapping claims, but but we also recognize the importance of sovereignty. And, and the Osages also, even though there's been a long and, and pretty um, unhappy history between Cherokees and Osages at different times, um, we also recognize you know, Cherokees didn't wanna be there. Um, and so we also recognize that the reason we are in this space in these small demarcated locations is because of US government policy. Um, so there are complicated conversations, but there is also a recognition that that is our reservation boundary. Um, and so whatever those complicated conversations are is between us and the relationship with the settler state is a different one. Thank you, Daniel. We are already, I think, about 10 minutes or close to it beyond our oh, I'm sorry. closing date. No, no, it's not uh, any complaint. But I do think that as we begin to lose people, I should thank you on behalf of the collective here, uh, because this has been truly a thought provoking, uh, stimulating talk. Uh, I do have one sort of last concluding reflection, which I hope will will provoke thought among the people who are still with us. And that is to really ask you and others to think about the significance as it were of the 49th parallel. It seems to me as a Canadianist that there has been an increasing tendency for the Canadian story to be elided with the US story on a whole series of uh, axes. And uh, although I don't for a minute wish to underplay the ill effects of the imposition of the liberal order across Canadian space in the 19th century uh, or the dispossession of indigenous people, I do think that the, the extent of the violence and the military attacks on indigenous people in the United States were much more severe than those in Canada. And the process of, of allotment uh, so far as I'm aware, did not occur to anything like the same extent as you have shared with us. And, and you are yourself, I think, better placed than almost anyone else I can think of to engage with this question because you've been now a resident of Canada for 20 years with 10 at UBC and 10 at the U of T before that. Uh, and your roots are in Cherokee territory in Oklahoma and in Colorado. Uh, so you, in some very meaningful sense, straddle the border. And I only hope that you can bring some clarity to this question, which is much more important for Canadians than for Americans. But I hope, Daniel, that you're on your way to becoming truly a Canadian, uh, to distinguish the Canadian story uh, from the American one. But that's a thought for the future. And I hope at some point we can have some further discussion about that. And that in itself is only a reflection of how valuable this talk has been in exposing some of the in grievous injustices of the past and in bringing us to think and think hard about the legacies of those processes, uh, how they played out differentially and what we can begin to do to unpick the consequences. So thank you very much indeed. And that sentiment is echoed a number of times on the chat. Uh, 
So we won't go back to specific questions. Apologies to anyone who has asked a question and not been attended to late in the game, but I hope you have enjoyed what Daniel has had to say as much as I have. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'll turn things back to Sandra Van Ark now, uh, just for a notice about uh, upcoming events of the Emeritus College. Just sharing my screen. So these are the events that are upcoming. You can find them on our website. And um, we hope to see you at the next general meeting on March 23rd and otherwise at any of the other events. Thank you and have a good day. <laughs>